You're listening to the Sledgehammer Podcast with me, Paul Ebbs. This week, we're going to be talking about the talons of Wang Chiang with that honourable and most talented writer, Mark Morris. Do you think they saw what I did there? But first, a little bit of history. Back in 2017, I undertook to watch all of televised Doctor Who in one calendar year because I'm insane and have no life. I would start on January the 1st with An Unearthly Child and sledgehammer my way through come hell, high water or removal to the nearest psychiatric facility to December the 25th, finishing on Twice Upon a Time. What started out as the Doctor Who fans' equivalent of the Harge rapidly turned into a project to try to understand how Doctor Who was written and is still being written. I would watch an episode, then immediately record my impressions on how it was constructed and plotted in what became the mammoth 350,000-word Sledgehammer Diary. With Doctor Who, often it's the facts and figures, the minutiae, the actors, producers and the special effects wizards who are lauded and picked over. But I've seen very few examples of Doctor Who stories being considered as pieces of writing. This podcast, I hope, will do that. Each week, I'll have a conversation with someone who has written or still writes Doctor Who stories. I'll talk to them about why they think a particular story is worth exploring from a writing perspective and how they themselves go about writing their own Doctor Who fiction. Hopefully, at the end of each episode, we'll have taken the bonnet off and had a good rummage around in the engines of the best Doctor Who stories and given you not only the encouragement to consider these stories afresh, but maybe some insights and inspiration to write your own. The Talons of Wen Chiang was written by Robert Holmes, produced by Philip Hinchcliffe, directed by David Maloney, and transmitted between February and April 1977. It is a huge, boiling stew of influences, pastiches, horror and literary touchstones. It ticks off pretty much everything you want from a Doctor Who story. It's brisk, immersive, shows the BBC's ability to do costume drama to the full, and it entertains without compromise. It's quite simply one of the best stories ever told in the format. Quite rightly, however, in recent years, it has come under some scrutiny for its use of yellow face, negative racial stereotyping and cultural appropriation. You simply wouldn't make the story now in the way it was made back then. But all that considered, it's a script that is brimful with fabulous writing. And even if you travelled back in Greel's time cabinet and fixed some of the issues people have with it today, you might not have to change many of the actual words. It is a quite staggering piece of television. Mark Morris is one of the best and most respected horror writers writing in English today. He came to widespread acclaim with his first book, Toady, and has continued to write novels which chill and entertain ever since. He has written and edited around 40 novels, novellas, short story collections and anthologies. And his script work includes radio dramas for Doctor Who, Jago and Lightfoot and the Hammer Chillers series. His most recent work includes the Obsidian Heart trilogy, new adaptations of the classic 1971 horror movie Blood on Satan's Claw and the M.R. James ghost story A View from a Hill, a 30th anniversary short story collection Warts and All, and as an editor, the anthology After Sundown. He has won several awards for his audio adaptations and he has been nominated for several Stokers and Shirley Jackson awards. He's basically top of the shop and I am really pleased he's agreed to join me here today to talk about Doctor Who and the mechanics of horror. Hello, Mark. Hello, hi. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing really good, thanks. Well, good. Nice to see you. Nice to uh, talk to you. I know we've never met, I don't think, in real space, but I've known you for a while online and we seem to get on okay, which is good. So I'm really pleased that you've agreed to come and be on Sledgehammer this week. 
Yeah, it's one of those things, isn't it? When you know somebody online, you know somebody on Facebook, and you've interacted a lot, and then suddenly you kind of meet up. Obviously, not in the flesh, but you know, yeah. online. See somebody actually kind of moving and talking is is a it's a weird thing. <laughs> You look like your author picture, so that's good. Yeah, yeah, you do. It's not like one of those dating things where the picture looks like somebody fantastic and then you meet them and, oh, my God, they look like a mutant. Um, so you don't look like a mutant, so I'm really glad about that. Thank you. That's, it's nice to know. <laughs> I know that I don't look like a mutant. Although my, my picture on Twitter, I have to say, is probably now about 15 years old, not through any vain type thing. It's just that I haven't got around to changing it for a long, yeah. long time. No, I think that's probably okay. So the listeners will know, because this is the fourth one that we're doing, the first half we'll be talking about one of your favourite Doctor Who stories that you want to talk about, not just because it's your favourite, but because it's a good piece of writing, and that's going to be The Talons of Wen Chiang. Um, and then the second half, I'm going to hopefully get under the bonnet of your process. We'll talk about horror. We'll talk about how you create stories, how you do stuff, and I'm really interested in that as well. So... Talons of Wing Chiang, it's an amazing story. I think I, I said to you yesterday, I sat down to watch, you know, to skim through it and, and all the best bits, all my favourite bits, and I just ended up watching all six episodes on the bounce. And I just, I couldn't stop. It's just so good. So what are your headlines for Talons then, Mark? Why is it, I know it's your most favourite story, but why is it a good piece of writing as well? Oh, it's, I mean, I know this story off by heart. It's like one of those albums where put on, and you know it so well that you even know how many beats there are between songs and you know exactly where the next thing's going to come in. Mm. And I've seen this story more times than any other. I, I must have seen it, I don't know, 10, 12 times, maybe something like that. And I feel as though I kind of know it off by heart. And so I was just today, actually, this morning, just to refresh myself, even though I don't know if I need refreshing that much. I was just reading the script book. I was just looking, reading through the script book and I was kind of reading it. I knew the inflections of the characters, the way they spoke, everything. And it's just... It just really struck me again how beautifully written it is. It's virtually every single line is beautiful. It's just so well structured. It just moves along so well. It's, it just flows so beautifully. You know, the dialogue. I'm in, I'm in awe of Robert Holmes' dialogue. It is eminently quotable. It's like every line feels like it's been carved by an artist. It doesn't feel like it is not a throwaway moment. And even with the way he uses vernacular in it, I think it's just so amazing that his ear for dialogue. Uh, Holmes, I mean, across all of his stories, but in particular this one, where even using the words like the Upazootics, you know, he's, he, you've got the Upazootics care. It's just amazing stuff. When you listen to the dialogue in it and you, you hear what Holmes is trying to do, what do you think he's trying to achieve with the dialogue? Well, particularly with this story, but with all of Holmes's work, there's like a real, it's very textural, his dialogue. There's like a real crispness and a real richness to it. It's like a you know a beautifully flavored stew i mean some scripts that you read and you listen to they just feel a bit empty and flavorless and you know but with robert holmes it's there is just a real texture to them and as a writer you feel as though he's relishing every line that he writes mm. i can imagine him sitting there writing jago who is a very difficult character to write because i've written him myself you know writing jago and absolutely loving every second of it and mm. just sitting there chuckling away and it's just every, you know, it's, every character is brilliant and is, yes. is a very, very crisply and quickly delineated. You know, mm. you know them straight away, even down to, and I think she's probably my favourite kind of peripheral character in all of Doctor Who, even down to the, the ghoul. Like yes. Part, just that one scene. And she, even in that one scene, she has about three or four killer lines, you know, mm. oh, you want that served with onions. <laughs> Yes. You know, and all that. <laughs> and it's, that <laughs> it's amazing. It's it's top level stuff and it's so gruesome as well. That scene. That scene is incredibly gruesome. Yeah, you wouldn't want that served up with onions, would you? It's yeah. it's, uh, it's enough to make an oar sick. <laughs> Just like yeah. not a single line that Holmes writes sounds throwaway to me it, it really does sound like it's a master craftsman doing his thing and i think anybody could learn how to pull character out of dialogue because if you look at somebody like buller just at the beginning you know the taxi driver at the beginning you know everything about him everything about his life everything about what he cares about, where he's coming from, from those just those lines, you know, those, those lines about you putting the fluence on her and you just know that person. He's he's fully rounded from two or three lines. And I, I find that 
absolutely amazing in what Holmes can do. Oh, it's a massive skill. And even yeah. later on when the policeman's talking about the Buller's home life and they're obviously living with his mother-in-law. I think his mother-in-law. Yeah, and her name's Nellie Gusset, which is yeah. a fantastic, <laughs> fantastic name. And again, I can just imagine Holmes writing that and chuckling away to himself as he, as he writes that name. Yeah, and you do. You just kind of think this poor guy is living with his mother-in-law and his wife disappeared. And you can probably imagine him getting a bit of an ear bashing about the fact that he doesn't know where she is and he's just sent him out looking for her and... You know, and it's just, yeah, it's, it's it's just amazing. It's just brilliant at just, you know, getting characters within, like you say, within a two or three lines. Two or three lines, they're there. They're, they're fully three-dimensional, real people, just in two or three lines. So the dialogue is, is amazing. Um, we'll come on to the plot in a little while. But for me, Talons is an amazing pastiche of about 17 different influences, isn't it? It's the Phantom of the Opera. It's Jack the Ripper. It's Sax Roma... Fu Manchu, it's Hammer Horror, it's everything. And obviously, I was going to say the big one, obviously, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes, yeah. Uh, yeah, even down to sort of Mrs. Hudson and the giant rat of Sumatra and things. It's funny, when I was looking through the script, I was jotting down all the influences and I was thinking, oh God, there's that in there. Was, oh, there's, there's this in there. Mm. You know, and it was Pygmalion and there's the good old days. And there's, with Mr. Sin, there's things like echoes of sort of dead of night or magic, you know. Yes. Those, those, things and it's um yeah i mean there are there are just so many influences in that i think it's probably the most influenced if you like doctor who story is it? yes or it's the one that carries its influences the most i think where holmes's skill in using pastiche like that is to still make it feel fresh and new it doesn't feel like it's one of those things it's all of those things to make a new thing and i think that's really good and bringing in the science fiction element is to tie it all together you know a greel is a vampire He's got a vampire machine. He's got a science, sciencey vampire machine. I think, you know, making a pastiche is one thing, but being able to turn it into something that feels new and fresh is really important as well. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, that is another influence, isn't it? Dracula is probably mm. an influence as well. I think the doctor describes him as a, a slavering, gangrenous vampire. Yeah. Which brings us back to the horror as well, because there are a lot of horror phrases that he uses. You know, he's mm. constantly talking about putrefying carcasses and putrefying remains. And I mean, going back to the science fiction element as well, there's just something about Holmes's language and the way he talks about science fiction elements, but also makes them sound Victorian, if you yes. like. Yes. So he talks about the Zygma energy, which, you know, and he talks about the peaking homunculus and mm. things like that, you know, and it had one, what was it, one organic component, the cerebral cortex of a pig, you know, <laughs> and, and all that kind of thing. And it just sounds kind of, I don't know, it's, it sounds like the sort of thing you would get in a Fu Manchu story, but it also sounds, like you say, very modern, very fresh, very 1970s. Yeah, I think you've made a really good point there, one that hadn't occurred to me. It actually feels like steampunk victorian elements to it i'd never yes it's set in victorian times or at the end of victoria's reign it's unclear where it is whether it's 1898 or just after 1900 it's not really clear because uh, lightfoot talks about coming back to london in 72 and that was a long time ago so that could be 20 years that could be 30 years but it does yeah it, everything about it the confluence of all of those influences you know mixing together and coming together with something new is something that I really value about it I think as a writer you often I don't know if you do this but I do this I, I often watch things you know with one eye as a viewer and one eye as a writer one ear as a writer maybe and with the talents of Wang Chiang I can still be lost in it because it's so good I don't have to think of it like a writer but if I do think of it like a writer I'm just like gobsmacked at how good it is we'll talk about the horror influences in a little while I just want to talk about the plot and six episodes are difficult beasts for Doctor Who. And the first three episodes, I think I'm right, take place over about 18 hours. Until you're about halfway through episode three, there's only about 18 hours has passed, which I think is interesting. And I've got a little theory about six-parters. The best six-parters deviate from the main story, so to speak. You know, like in Seeds of Doom, you've got the two episodes in, in the Antarctic and in the Time Monster, which I love, but lots of people don't. I love the Sojourn to Atlantis. I think that's really great. And what I think Holmes does with this is he's very clever in that he, although it's all, it seems to be quite, 
linear, the first two and a half episodes are just an action movie. Until the second night, when the Doctor takes Leela to the Palace Theatre to watch Lee Sen Cheng's magic show, it's taken part in a really compact amount of time. So it's one thing, one bang, 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 bang. The plot never gets a chance to become becalmed or that you have to dick about waiting for other stuff to happen. Yeah, you know, that hadn't really occurred to me. I've never really thought about the time element of it, how long it takes. I think because I get you get so caught up in it that you don't kind of mm. sometimes think, is it night, is it day, What you, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, and that, going back to the six-part thing, it, it is like Seeds of Doom, but the other way around. It's a four-parter, mm. then a two-parter. Mm. So you've got the four-parter, which I always think of as like the Palace Theatre four-parter, mm -hmm. because it's when uh, Magnus Greel has his lair underneath yeah. the... Theater. Phantom of the Opera. The Phantom of the Opera, yeah. And then in the final two-part is the House of the Dragon story. Yeah. So, you know, he relocates to the House of the Dragon. Mm. And also, that, amazingly, it's not until the beginning of part five that Jago and Lightfoot meet up. So that's the yeah. kind of Jago and Lightfoot story as well. Yeah. I kind of think they're this great double act, but they're only together for a, an episode and a half. And a bit, yeah. I mean, I mean, absolutely. And Holmes, again bless him showing absolutely being open about his influences has jago talking about come and see the phantom's lair you know even jago calls him the phantom because it's the phantom of the opera and it's just i love it i think that you're right there about the two parts but i think the first two and a half episodes taking place over 18 hours about from the first house the afternoon before to the early evening to the second house and then overnight for the attack on Lightfoot and it's brilliant plotting. So what do you think of the plot in terms of what goes on over those six episodes? What do I think of it in what way? As a piece of writing, really. I mean, how do you, oh. does anything about it make you think, ah, oh, that's really good? Or is it just a bog standard adventure plot? No, the whole of it, you know, just saying the whole thing. But it mm. is the whole, every single scene is beautifully constructed, beautifully balanced, if you like, and it, and every single scene moves the plot along. And you're talking about it, yes, it is a an action movie in a way. It is like one one thing after another. But there are also some quite quiet scenes in among that, but they still push the plot along. Hmm. You know, I'm the scenes where where Leela goes back with Lightfoot for the cold collation. You know, that yes, beautiful scene. Yes, that's Pygmalion, isn't it? Pygmalion scene, yeah. yeah. And it's still, but every little scene still moves the plot along, still moves the story along. But do you notice how he turns the Pygmalion thing on its head there and Lightfoot becomes Leela rather than Leela becoming Lightfoot? He starts to eat the meat the way that she does so as not yeah. to offend her and to, to be a good English gentleman. And he, that, that's such a smart piece of character writing. It is brilliant. And another thing he does is he is constantly turning. We're talking about like what um, Holmes and Watson and they become different people all the way through. Obviously, mm. the doctor is the, the kind of Holmes character. Yeah. But when the doctor's not there, you know, when you've got Lightfoot and Jago together, it's it's, you know, Lightfoot is is the kind of the Watson to the doctor. Mm -hmm. But then comes the kind of the Holmes to Jago's Watson, if you like. And, yeah. you know, then in, in, in other scenes, that it's kind of interchanges an awful lot. And at other times, obviously, when Jay goes with the doctor, Jay goes seems like Watson to the doctor, you know, and mm. it's, I love the way he does that. I just, it's just beautiful the way he does that. I absolutely agree. So uh, moving on just a little, it's horrific, isn't it? it? It's a horror story as well as an action movie. So where are you with what Holmes does with horror in it? I mean, all those little bits of horror, how it adds up to something that's quite sinister and quite, you know, if you think about it, if you think deeply about it, it's pretty horrific, especially what happens to the girls. Mm. It's, yeah, it, it is. It's kind of, it, you know, what what did Mark, uh, Mary Whitehouse say? Tea time, terror for tots or something. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and, and it, it kind of really pushes it as far as it can for sort of Saturday tea time TV. I mean, it's not just that the girls die in a horrible way, because he talks about how being in the distillation chamber in his camps was the most horrible way to die. Yeah. He actually talks about that. So it's like... um it's a, you know, it's obviously a really horrible way for these sort of poor, innocent girls to die. The fact that in the last couple of episodes, when there's the two girls who, you know, manage to escape, the doctor rescues them and tells them to flee. And Lightfoot makes the point that 
oh, you know, neither of them are, are come more than 16 years old. Yep. And it's his, it's Greel's kind of just casualness about them. He's mm. he's disdainful about these girls. He doesn't see them as human beings. No. He sees them as, you know, he constantly refers to them as slattens and, you know, worthless pieces of garbage and all this kind of thing. One of the things that's not explored in it, but is there right in our faces, is that he doesn't want men in his machine. He only wants young girls. It can't just be any human. It has to be young girls. And that's the that's the Jack the Ripper thing. But that's quite uh, as well, isn't it, really? If you think about it, that's just a, that's an extra horrible patterner over the, the whole vampire thing. Because at least you talk about Hammer films, maybe, and Christopher Lee refused to bite men. He, re- he would never bite me. He always, you know, if it was in the script, he, he wouldn't do it. But that's just Christopher Lee being Christopher Lee. Here... Magnus Greel uh, won't vampirise men at all. And that's just an extra layer of sinister on it. That's the way to make that idea even more horrible, isn't it? Mm, it is. It's, it's also quite a traditional thing in that, you know, it's the it's the girl tied to the railway tracks, you know. You yeah. Know, you get the girl tied to the rail, railway tracks. Yeah, so it's, it's I think, you know, it's always... And, and they do talk about the Ripper. So he obviously wanted that uh, that parallel in that, yeah. you know, the Ripper killed young girls kind of thing or yeah. prostitutes. So, you know, I don't know how much of that is actually Robert Holmes thinking, oh, this will make it extra nasty, or how much of it is just tradition. Just tradition? Yeah, that's a pretty good point. Leading into, alongside that, connected to that, is how adult it is as well. How it's not a traditional children's type story. You've got prostitutes in it. The girl that this end Jen goes and gets is obviously a prostitute. She is obviously a woman of the night and he goes and gets her. And it doesn't show you know, she's not a little rosy cheeked apple seller, flower seller. She's a prostitute. And so there's Holmes again confronting you know what, what's that line from um ghostlight where you know you scratch the victorian veneer and it's still horrible underneath you know he didn't shy away from all of the nastiness of the victorian era oh no not at all it, it's it's full of body horror yeah it's full you know it's chang gets his leg torn off by a rat oh, yeah uh, and it's quite graphic when you see it again the um the body floats i know it's face down but there's mm. kind of this bloated corpse that's floating in the water yeah, you know, and there's all that, and there's just lots of talk of kind of putrefying remains. As <laughs> Actually, <laughs> that scene with the body, if the body, you know, floating in the water, Buller's body floating in the water, and then you get the autopsy as well, which is, I know you don't see the body, but the doctor and Lightfoot are looking at it and describing, you know, how it's been chewed to pieces by a rat. But then it gets worse. No, no, that didn't kill him. That all happened after death. He was stabbed in the heart. That lovely yeah. sequence with Leela talking about how she was trained to stab under the breastbone. And he's just like, the, you hear people screaming. That's the sound of death. It is horrific. And I don't, I must admit, I don't remember being particularly terrified of it as a kid. And maybe I'm strange. Did it affect you as a kid? Well, I saw it when I was almost 14. No. So I'd kind of grown out of the being terrified of Doctor Who by that time. I mean, I, I first started watching it in, in Patrick Troughton's day, and I have many, many memories of it pretty much traumatising me, but, you know, not to the extent that, that I wouldn't go back the following week and watch it. <laughs> oh, no, absolutely. So by, I probably by the end of, I think, probably John Pertwee's final season was the last time that I was actually kind of found it tense and scary. Yeah. After that, I just... There were moments... Um, and especially, I remember things like the end of part one of Terror of the Zygons when you see the yes. Zygon for the first time, which is the best jump. It's the best God. jump scare in all yeah. Doctor Who, without without a doubt. My personal terror is the Autons coming out of the glass. So I saw that as a five year old, and I remember maybe a few days later standing at the bus stop with my mum outside Burton's and looking at the shop window dummies, shaking wondering whether they were about to come out and shoot me. I, know, I remember being terrified. And the spiders, I didn't like the spiders in Planet of the Spiders. And it's obviously Zygons, obviously, definitely. That scared the living bejesus out of me. Um, but no, terror, yeah, how old would I have been? I was 12, I think, 70, 77, is it? Yeah. yeah, 12, 13. And I don't remember being terrified by it, but I remember being really excited by it. Really, this is, you know, this is the best thing. So could they make Talon's today i'd say no i'd say they wouldn't even have leela today as a companion because she's always all this you know carrying the knife 
the, mm. the, you know, the, the I suppose the, the face of evil book cover, which yeah. is the classic pose of a po- pose with the with a knife upheld in a hand. I'm pretty sure they wouldn't have a character now who constantly carries a knife or constantly kills people with yeah. poisonous thorns. You know, Janus um, thorns, yeah. Thorns, yeah. I, d- I honestly don't think they would, mate. Or, or if they did, they would really tone it down, hmm. which would take away a lot of the um, the impact of it. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I know we've you know we've moved on and stuff, and there, there are bits as, as I was talking to you about when we were preparing for this. There are bits of talons which are you can these days say that were they weren't racist in the terms of you know what they thought they were doing that's just because they weren't as aware as we are of cultural appropriation and not using the actors from the right background uh, and and racial profile so there are bits of it that are uncomfortable and I, it would be wrong for us not to mention that but i think if you step aside from that just a bit and just look at it purely as a piece of adventure horror television it's mm. pretty near the top isn't it yeah, it is. And I just think about Leela carrying a knife, but also Mr. Sin, you know, Mr. Yes. Sin kills with a knife as well. And I just don't think you would get any... Nowadays, if they may, if they did a Mr. Sin, he would have some kind of science fiction-y way of killing. Yes. You know? Yeah. When I, it... when I wrote one of my um, Doctor Who novels, Forever Autumn, I had a scene where a kind of clown costume comes to life and, assumes, and chases, uh, I think it's Martha down the street. Yeah. And in that, I had his fingers, big white clown gloves, and I had his fingers turning into great big blades, like kind of Eddie, that Freddy Krueger type. Yeah. Blades. And that was vetoed. It was oh, like, right. no, no knives, no blades. But even if it's a white science fiction-y type blade, we, we, we can't have blades at all. So, you know, I think that they definitely wouldn't be, wouldn't have that. Which is, you know, it's fair enough. I mean, there always, there is a lot of knife crime around now and stuff. Yeah. But- you know, you don't want Doctor Who being blamed for that. Well, yeah, you know, you don't want Doctor Who blamed for that. And I suppose we all have to be a bit more responsible now. You probably couldn't get away with the cleaners in Paradise Towers with their big drills and, and horrible, horrible things. It's a shame, I think. I'm not getting political or anything, but it is a shame that fantasy violence has become conflated with real violence. Yeah, so, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And you're... Uh, I mean, you... <laughs> I know, I agree, yeah. <laughs> but but that's, I mean, obviously that's how you make your living. That's, you know, you know, writing a lot of horror and very well known for it and very good at it. It's, I think it's it's just difficult. And I, what do you think, would you show Talents of Wen Chiang to a 12-year-old or a 10-year-old now? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I've showed it to my kids. All right, uh, yeah. Know, uh, when they were five, six, seven years old, kind of All thing, right. when I thought. They were ready for Doctor Who. Uh-huh. Uh, and and did Childline get in touch? <laughs> <laughs> Probably will now. Yeah. <laughs> Shall I cut that bit? But yeah, I I remember showing it to my son as well when he was, I suppose, about 10 or 12, because he's 29, going on 30 this year. So his, yeah, I did show it to him. I showed a lot of Doctor Who to my son when I was a kid, but the one he loved the most when he was really young was Silver Nemesis. And he's obviously got no taste whatsoever, as he is. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind Silver Nemesis, but it's, it, it's not a great one. So we're, we're moving towards the end of talking about Talons of Wen Chiang. Any areas you want to talk about now that we might not have talked about as a piece of writing? Let me consult my notes. Yep, Don't... that's fine. I've, I've written a few notes, so let yep. me just consult my notes and um, and I'll see if there's anything that we haven't talked about. That uh, I mean, it's just I... a mutual appreciation society yeah, at the moment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd like if we could to talk about it technically, really, as a piece okay. of writing. That would that would be nice. Yeah, there was one thing I thought about is, uh, I mean, I have noted down lots of little quotes and things here, which are just, you know, I just love so many great little moments. But one thing that really struck me when I have watched it again is people talk about like kind of continuity errors or whatever in Doctor you know, why did he do this? Why did that happen? And not not continuity as in the greater continuity, but just mm. within the story. Within the it's story, like, yeah. Uh, kind of pyramids of Mars. Why does why does he take all the stuff all the way to England to build the pyramids? Why mm. didn't they just build it in the desert? You know that. Yeah. Kind of thing. And the one thing that I did think about with that, and it only struck me after I'd watched it four or five times, is when the Doctor says talks about the tongue of the black scorpion. Yep. Says. You know, and he, and he realizes that the tongue of the black scorpion are active in London. And he says to the policeman something like, you know, if the tongue of the black scorpion are active here in London, it calls them a politico criminal organization. Yeah. Mm. You're going to need all the help you can get. And that's kind of his modus operandi for staying 
And at the time, it kind of struck me as a bit odd because I think it's, well, there are, you know, there are big criminal organisations all over the world. So it's like the doctor going to New York and saying, oh, if the mafia are active here in New York, you, you know, I better, I better stay in hell, you know. And then afterwards, I, I, after thinking about that for a while, I thought, well, it's probably just because it's become personal. Yeah. It's, it's, that's the pure, that's how you can reason it out, is the fact mm. that, you know, the Doctor and Leela were just on their way to the theatre and they got caught up in this fracas and they were attacked by some Chinese guys. They saw them carrying a body, all that kind of thing. Yeah. And it's the Doctor's natural curiosity. And the whole thing about, oh, I better stay in hell because it's the tongue of the Black Scorpion is basically just an excuse. Yes. From him. Yeah, you know? I, I think he's also placating the, the policeman who basically doesn't want him there yeah. mucking up his police station and getting in the way. So he's up in the ante. But yes, the, the whole Tong thing is interesting because the reason Greel is in London is because they've managed to track where the time cabinet is, which was brought back by Lightfoot's family. There's never any, and I, I can't remember from the novel, and I will read the novel again at some point because I'm going through the Target books as we speak. I can't remember if there was, there's anything in the novel that suggests how long Greel had been at the bottom of the Palace Theatre because it's never mentioned on screen how long he's been there looking for the time cabinet in London. He, I mean, he's only been there a couple of weeks. There's only eight women gone missing. He gets rid of like four women in about 24 hours. So has he only been there three days? But obviously, his henchman is a magician. So, you know, he's obviously been working at the Palace Theatre for a while and Greel has been downstairs. So in terms of the backstory, I probably would have liked a little bit more exposition. And there is something that I do... Actually, it's just occurred to me. There is something I do want to talk about, which is the interminably long magic show, which just <laughs> feels like we've got this bloody theatre, so let's have this... I mean, Holmes is not bad. It kind of moves the plot on a bit but it goes on forever episode four is about half of it is just that bloody magic show and that's the only part of the i mean i love magic i haven't got a problem with magic but that's the only part that i feel just is a bit gratuitous it's like the um the city of death thing we're in bloody france you're gonna bloody see france and so so i don't, I don't do you does it strike you as just a bit i'm treading water here that episode four bit of, of the very long magic show hasn't before to be honest are we talking about the one near the beginning where he levitates the woman or no 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 the, the one where the doctor goes into the cabinet right i think all that is fine because it's the doctors involved in that and it's all the kind of the playing with him with the cards you know yeah. and stage and and then you've got all the stuff of real coming up out of his lair you've got there's lots of other business going on yeah you know real coming up out of his lair and casey dies of, of shock Mm -hmm. Then Casey, you know, all that kind of thing. Casey collapses on the stage and all that kind of thing. So I think it's okay. You think it's okay, do you? I think oh, there's right. a lot of stuff going on. The one thing, actually, that, <laughs> that occurred to me, going back to the first magic show, the Levitating yeah. show, which obviously he does because Bull has talked about, you know, Levitated her, you did. Yeah, you Levitated her. Put so the fluence kind of, on her. Put the fluence on it, yeah. But then, and Jay goes watching from the sidelines, and he looks across at, he looks at Mr. Sin, and he sees, like, blood trickling. Oh, yeah. Him. Yeah. Please, which is a, a gruesome image, but I, I remember it did occur to me. I thought to myself that if he just stabbed that guy through the heart, why has he got blood trickling out of his sleeve? Did blood like squirt all the way up his sleeve, and it's only just now trickling <laughs> out down his hand? I don't think we can blame Robert Holmes for that. Really, that's that's, <laughs> the, that's Maloney and the makeup people. But I, I think a uh, Mister Sin is a particularly horrible creation as well, isn't he? I mean, he's properly a, the cerebral cortex of a pig in a body held together by magnets that was made as a toy for children. Yeah. But yeah. went a bit crazy. <laughs> yeah. He's a horror. Yeah, he's just a little lump of hate, isn't he? And he's, yeah. I'm sure if I'd seen that when I was seven, I would have found Mr. Sin absolutely terrifying. Yeah, I, I think, been. yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> it is. Know. Yeah. And the way, I mean, the way he jumps down uh, off the wall at, at the beginning and intercepts Buller and then obviously mm. kills him. And it's just, the, the great thing about that is that the sound as well, because it's just, when he, particularly on that scene, when he jumps down off the wall, you can kind of hear all his limbs clicking together. Mm. You know, there's that horrible clicking as he, mm. as he moves towards him. 
And then, of course, later on, he starts to sort of snort and grunt like a pig. Yes. I don't know if you've watched the Blu-ray, but the um, th- that's much louder on the Blu-ray. That they, they, it, Mark Ayers or whatever, it, it seems to me, when I was listening to it yesterday, because it was the first time I'd watched the Blu-ray since I got the box set, uh, that the pig noises were much louder than I remembered. And I, right. so I thought, yeah, I know I can. Re-. And obviously the neck snap, which they took out of the video release and everything, because you, you can't hear the neck. That's back in there as well, which what yeah. a great. So so we're at the end now, pretty much, of Talents of Wang Chiang before we move on to, to you. Just wrap it up. Wrap it up for me, Mark. Wrap up what Talents of Wang Chiang means to you as a piece. Did it inspire you as a writer? I think it did, because it was when I was a kid, I had, like a lot of people, a, a tape recorder. And I used to occasionally tape Doctor Who. And I, I still have tapes of Planet of Evil and wow. Talons of Wang Chiang, which I taped off the telly at the time, complete with my mum shouting, tea's ready, and the dog barking when somebody knocks at the door, and all that kind of thing in the background, and me going, yeah. shh, shh, you know. <laughs> and um, I still got that. And I remember I, with Talons of Wang Chiang, I felt so, so inspired by it that as soon as... It, it finished. I would sit and listen to the tape again, and play, I probably played it several times over that week. And then I would write an I would write a novelization. Oh wow! So I don't still have that novelization. Oh, so. oh what a shame! But I remember sitting after the end of each week's episode and writing the novelization and trying mm. to write it while it was still fresh in my mind, while I could still yeah. remember the rules. And I still, to this day, remember. There's that long scene. I think is it episode two. When the doctor's chasing Greel around the theatre, uh-huh. do you remember the? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, uh, it's, I think it's episode two. And literally, when you listen to it on tape, there's about it's literally about five minutes of just noises, sounds, yeah. incidental yeah. music. And I remember finding that really, really difficult to write because I just couldn't remember all the ins and outs of it. So I just kind of made up my own version of what was happening there. Oh man, yeah. I'd love to read that. I novelised Stones of Blood. I did that when I was thirteen. That was my favourite one, Stones of Blood. <laughs> you know, all I think we've all done it. All Doctor Who fans have become writers. I'm yeah. sure at some point have done a novelisation of a Doctor Who story. Oh yeah, uh, and I taped them as well. I, I, ta- I like you. I taped them. I think I started with I had Destiny of the Daleks. I think that was the earliest one that I taped. So that's just a little bit after, season after the Talons. And I taped all the way through, oh, for years. I loved it and listened to them again. Again, they've been lost in time, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. I, 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 I wish I still had them. I actually, I found it so stressful to do it because I was always wanting everyone to be quiet that I only, I don't know why, but I just chose random stories. I didn't do it every single week. Ah, oh, right. I did it every I week. Planet of Evil, but all four episodes. And I did Seeds of Doom. And I did Talons of Wang Chiang. Those might have been the only three. And I don't know why I chose those. I just, it was just a random thing. I just thought, right, I'm going to take this, you know, this story now. Mm-hmm. But I didn't do it all the time. Thanks, Mark. That was brilliant. I really enjoyed talking with you about Talons of Wang Chiang, which is obviously just a masterpiece, an absolute masterpiece. So now I want to talk about you. So for people who are not an expert in Mark Morris, you know, there may be two or three people out there who are not experts in Mark Morris. Tell us a bit about how you got started. Uh, that's very flashing, man. I'm sure there are many more than two or three. Um, Maybe five. <laughs> five, at least five. Yeah, I, I've been a full-time writer since 1988. I, I graduated in 84. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life, except I knew that I really loved writing and I'd always loved writing as a kid. And so I kind of signed on, was half-heartedly applying for jobs, thinking I don't know what to do, and just started writing. I was living in a little bedsit in Leeds. My wife got me a little portable typewriter, which, uh, which is a story in itself, in that she was working at Central TV and the Crossroads office were throwing out all their old typewriters because wow. they were moving computers and she grabbed one of the old crossroads typing you know typewriters that, that they used to oh that's to. brilliant man so, so that was my, my first typewriter so yeah so i was sitting in my little bed just writing stories writing scripts entering competitions i wrote a novel called the winter tree which was a horror novel which wasn't published but almost but garnered a lot of interest from publishers and was almost published by a couple but didn't quite make it 
And then I wrote a novel called Toadie, which took me about two years to write. So I was on the dole writing this novel, Toadie, and I was getting more and more hassle from, there was a thing called the restart scheme, you know, where they were basically people who were long-term unemployed, which I was by that time. They wanted to get them into back into work. So I remember going for a, an interview with this guy, and he was kind of an, an old retired industry guy who the, you know, the, the government sort of employed to talk to you know, young whippersnappers like me who could find a job. Um, <laughs> And I kind of had, I think at the time, I might be wrong about this, but I think at the time the Enterprise Allowance Scheme had just started up and my wife went on it before me. She's an artist. And I was kind of thinking of going on the Enterprise Allowance Scheme, but I wanted to finish Toady first, the novel, which was a very long novel and took me a long time to write. And so that I could spend the year marketing it and then writing a new novel in that year. Or trying to sell it, sorry, not marketing it, but trying to sell it. And so I went for this restart interview. And I just remember, still remember to this day, and this this became a real kind of, kind of really inspired me and kind of spurred me on to do my own thing. I went with a load of big pile of paper. So a big pile of stories, a novel that I'd written, you know, all sorts of things, just to show that I wasn't sitting on my ass doing nothing. I was actually trying to do something. And this guy says to me, so, you know, what have you been doing to try and get a job? And I just said, I remember saying to him, look, I, I, I really want to become a writer. And I've been getting, I took in loads of letters, feedback letters that were very positive and all that kind of thing. And I just remember him just dismissing it, just this sneery dismissal. And he just sort of went, you're flogging a dead horse there, mate. And he said, I think the thing to do is to go to Debenhams in Leeds City Centre, get yourself a job on the shop floor. He says, you're a clever lad. You could work yourself up into management within a year or two. That was it. That was his advice. But that made me think, right, I'm going to become a writer and nothing's going to stop me. Yes. So I, I went on Enterprise Allowance. I finished Toady, went on Enterprise Allowance. This was September 1988 and sent Toady out to various different publishers. And within six weeks, I think it was, of going on the scheme, managed to sell it to a small publisher called Piatkas, a hardback publisher. And it was that was it from there on. And then I kind of carried on from there. I wrote my second novel, Stitch, during the first year of Enterprise Allowance. Then Piatkas managed to sell Toadie in paperback. They kind of acted as my agent. I didn't have an agent at this time. But they managed, kind of acted as my agent and managed to sell it to Corgi, Transworld, who then, you know, really splashed out on it, put lots of publicity behind it. Mm. And it came out in paperback and immediately hit the kind of top 10 bestseller lists. And it was huge and... You know, there were big dump bins in bookshops. and It's an amazing novel. That's that's how I first became aware of you. And uh, long before Doctor Who or long before anything, I'd read Toadie and I thought Toadie was an amazing novel. Really, really good, good novel. Thank you. Well, it was one of those, it was a novel that, it was when I wrote it at the time, it was, it is a big, big novel, you know, it's 700 pages. And I actually ended up, for, for, I actually bought it on the proviso that I would cut it down by about 30%, which I did. So it was over, a th- you know, the manuscript was about, 11 1200 pages long it was enormous unwieldy thing and i cut it down and it when it finally came out in paperback i think it was about 700 pages or so Mm. which was you know which was kind of fashionable back then these big doorstop horror novels type thing it kind of worked for me in the end because because it was such a big fat novel and expensive to produce it meant that when it came out in paperback corgi thought right we've really got to put a lot behind this to recoup our money you know and they did, bless them. Yeah, and it kind of just, yeah, as I say, it hit the bestseller lists, and I just kind of thought, well, this is it. This is what it's going to be like yeah. from now on, you know, which obviously it hasn't been. No, it's been, no. It's uh, been very up and down over the years, as all <clears throat> right, who are in for the long haul will find. Yeah. Um, I'm very, very, very lucky. Well, no, no, not lucky. Good. <laughs> well, yeah. Whenever I say to my other half, oh, I've been very lucky to get this, she says, no, you're good. <laughs> You're not lucky. Lucky, lucky would be if you were you were rubbish, but still got published. You know, you have to you have to be good. And so you know. Um. So why horror? Why horror is just something I feel as though I was kind of born a born horror fan, horror writer. It's something I've always always been drawn to. Every from being a kid, I just remember being gravitating towards the stories that were scary, that had ghosts in them, that had monsters in them. That had aliens in them, you know, something that just kind of not that I haven't I haven't read other things as well. I remember as a kid loving things like the James Herriot books and stuff, and you know that kind of thing. fantastic. But yeah, but 
it's just always some uh, when i was a kid when we used to go to the library i would always get out anthologies of ghost stories or anything that had a ghost or a monster on the cover i would gravitate towards doctor who for me was brilliant because it was the first thing that i was ever properly scared by it was mm. you know the first thing i ever saw or experienced any kind of story that i was properly scared by you know my first memory of it is is the abominable snowman when i was oh wow four. And I and I, to this day I still remember being terrified just by Padma Padma Bamsava. Is that how you pronounce yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. Withered hand creeping across this sort of chessboard or relief map of the of the uh, Tibetan mountainside. I just remember being terrified by his hand because I thought, God, if his hand is that withered and horrible, what's the rest of his body going to be like? You know. And, That's um, brilliant, yeah. And and I was also I like like you. I was terrified by Spearhead from Space, but just mm. before that, I was terrified by the Cybermen in the Invasion. And I think what got to me about both the Cybermen and the Autons was the fact that these things killed people, but they did it with just completely blank faces. It mm. was that kind of not caring, not showing any emotion thing that I found utterly terrifying. Yeah, you know, this kind of these emotionless killers. And I just remember that that kind of feeling of just thinking how can something be so emotionless and blank face and yet kill people so it, it was yeah so it i mean i'm yeah it, it's a long answer but there you go no no great answer absolutely fabulous i know that you and i were both very much you know because we're almost contemporaries in in terms of our age i was born in 65 you were 64 63 63, 63. Yeah. so obviously we grew up reading the pan Books mm. of horror as well, didn't we? I loved those during the seventies. I would, you know, whenever I could find one in Smith's, I would absolutely eat that up. And then I discovered yes. James Herbert, and I discovered Guy N. Smith, and I discovered Stephen King. I've always had an affinity, like you, I've always had an affinity with horror. I've never written much horror, but I've always had an affinity with it. So I know where you're coming from with being scared. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, talking about the pan books of horror as well. Yeah, it was um, a story of when I read my first pan book of horror. And again, this is a very formative experience for me is that i remember very very clearly it was the 11th fan book of horror that i came across i was was i 12 years old yes it was no i was 11 years old because i read it on new year's eve 1974 and i remember this so clearly because we lived on a cul-de-sac on the kind of a new bill cul-de-sac when i was growing up in huddersfield and there was lots of young families in the street and i remember all the adults were having a party over at one of the adult houses and so us kids were kind of, I went across to some friend's house and I was staying with these friends and our mum and dads were all at this party just across the road. And we kids were given like pop and crisps and stuff and told, you know, you can stay up till 12 and then you got to go to bed. So I was sleeping in this little box room at the front of the house on the ground floor that faced out onto the street. And it was, I remember going to bed, it must've been about midnight, just after midnight. And I sat up in this room and I started reading the 11th fan book of horror stories. Mm. And I must read two or three stories i can't remember and then and then i thought oh I better go to sleep now and i remember switching the light off and because this was like a little box room there was sort of clothes hanging on the wardrobe there were boxes and things around and i remember just turning the light off and then just kind of seeing these shapes in the darkness oh wow and, you know the suit of clothes hanging on the wardrobe suddenly i thought that's actually somebody's there's somebody standing there there's somebody standing there <sighs> And, and, you know, and then all these like dark boxes just seemed to be sort of little crouching figures. And I was convinced as an 11 year that they were transforming. Oh, they wow. Were what they really were in the in the darkness. So I just I remember just kept switching the light on and just making sure that everything was OK, then switching the light off again. <laughs> and I clearly remember it being incredibly traumatizing experience. Oh, I yeah. Now with such fond nostalgia. Absolutely. Which is a weird, a yeah. weird thing. So, Brilliant. So let's talk about your process now, a little bit about Mark Morris, the writer. And I'm not going to ask, where do your ideas come from, Mark? Let's just say you've got your idea. Now you've got your idea, what do you do? Usually, if it's a novel, it's several ideas that come together over quite a long time. So I may be thinking about, usually I get a little kernel of an idea and then other ideas will start to intrude. I usually think with a novel, it's usually something like three or four very disparate ideas that kind of almost kind of just gravitate together, come together and form something new and exciting. You know, there might be three or four completely different things. So I kind of let that percolate for a while. I jot notes down. I don't really push it or anything. I just let it kind of come together. And then I find that as I'm getting more and more 
toward the actual beginning of it, I'm starting to get more and more excited. I'm writing more notes down. Then I usually start doing some research if I need to do some research. And then quite often I find other things that then excite me that I think, oh, I can bring that into it. Oh, that's a really great. Oh, that fits in brilliantly. And then I'm quite an actual, when I've got all the elements together, I'm quite a careful writer in that. I know a lot of my friends, they kind of just go with it. They just start writing and they, they've actually said to me, if I knew what was going to happen, I would get bored and I wouldn't want to write it. Whereas with me, I kind of then plan it out quite carefully. So I'll, right. I'll plan out like a 30 or 40 page like plan of how wow. so I, I know pretty much how many chapters it's going to be all the beats along the way more or less how it's going to end although sometimes that changes and then I just start writing it and I feel for me it's actually having a plan having like a good concrete plan in place then frees me up creatively because then mm. I'm, I'm kind of I'm not worrying constantly about oh is this making sense where's the plot going to go you know where's the story going to go next I know mm. where it's going to go so then it really frees me up creatively to create all the characters and all the peripheral stuff and to create the atmosphere and all that kind of thing. So obviously you've read Stephen King's on writing, I'm sure, you know, we've, we've all read that. And he does it in a completely different way, doesn't he? he? He talks about stories being, you know, like a he doesn't know where the story is. All he can see is the top of one bone sticking out of the ground and he starts picking away at the archaeology of it and he doesn't know what the dinosaur is going to be that he's going to uncover. So I kind of do things like that and sometimes I do what you do. When I worked in television, I had to do really, really, really detailed outlines, every single scene, every single thing. And talking to Rob Shearman the other week in this, he's not so much a planner either when he got to do dalek russell didn't make him do an outline he said outline's not good for you just go away and write it and then we'll make it work so there's no one right way how did you arrive at that way to do things were you taught is it something that you heard from other writers or is it just something you developed yourself no it's just trial and error i think it's just as the years go on you find your best way of writing and I think I have tried other things. I have, I did once try that. I wrote a novel called The Secret of Anatomy, and I did try to write that just completely off the top of my head and quickly mm. found that I was getting, that I was, you know, painting myself into corners. I was forgetting what characters were doing at what point and who uh -huh. was doing what and all that. Kind of, and I just thought, I can't do it like this. Mm. So I just kind of went back and planned it and plotted it out. And I've just found it's just always worked best for me. And I think the thing with a lot of my writing now, and particularly with Toadie, which was, you know, was my first published novel, is that I tend to write books with a lot of characters in. So I sometimes tend to write like multi-character, lots of subplots, sometimes quite complicated, convoluted plots, especially with things like the Obsidian Heart trilogy, which was a big time travel thing mm. that I wrote for Titan. And there's no way, absolutely no way, I would have been able to just do that off the top of my head. No. There's no way I'd been able to keep all those elements in place. Yeah. I think, you know, I, I do it sometimes with short stories, but then with a short story, you've quite often got a very contained environment. Yeah. And you've got maybe three or four characters, and that's it. So it's easy to keep control of those elements. But when you've got 30 characters and whatnot, it's, it's much more difficult. Is there a difference in the way you write your novels, your horror novels, that are not part of the Doctor Who universe, and the way that you create a Doctor Who story? Do you have a different process for Doctor Who? Not massively, to be honest. Only in the sense that the deadlines and the word count things are far more, far tighter. Hmm. So you know, apart from that, it's no, not really. I mean, I still, obviously with Doctor Who, you know, they have to be, I don't, I don't know, 35,000, 40,000 words, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I haven't written for quite a while, actually. <laughs> and that's just a case of then plotting it to that length. And I kind of think I've, because I've written now a lot of, a lot of movie novelizations, a lot of tie-in books, a lot of uh, audio drama scripts that have to be a certain length. I've almost got like a kind of instinctive feel for what constitutes 40,000 words worth of story. Mm -hmm. uh, I kind of know how, how long that should be. So the thing with when I do my own stuff is it's just a bit freer. It just doesn't matter if, you know, mm. it doesn't matter if I do 80,000 words, 100,000 words, 120,000 words. It's just a case of like coming up with the story and and I can embellish the story if I want to and, you know, all that kind of thing. So you say you, three or four ideas come together and then you, they percolate over a while. Where do you start creating the characters? Or do you say one of those ideas, maybe a character, 
as well or do you have your story in mind and then find the characters to fit it it's uh, there's no one one definite way of doing it it sometimes a character might be my first point of call mm-hmm. so i think oh i really you know i really want to write about this particular type of character i might think oh i really want to write about a woman whose brother has gone missing and she sets out to look for him or something like that you know mm. it, other times it's just the kind of the idea the story that bits or bits of the story that come together and then i start working out who the characters are going to be mm. the one i'm now the book I'm writing now, the characters came after the initial ideas sort of came into play. Mm. And again, it's just for me, the whole secret of it is just not forcing it. I think if you sit down and you think, right, today I'm going to work out who my characters are going to be, then you're just kind of pushing it and forcing it. When whereas I, I kind of like it to come in bits and I almost kind of like it to come subconsciously. So I'm not sort of thinking what these characters should be. It's almost like they, they, they kind of come out of left field and I suddenly think, oh, that would be great if he yeah. this happened or whatever. Mm. And it can be anything. And sometimes it's just the simplest things can sort of spark off a bit of excitement in you. You know, you might just think, oh, what if he has, what if he has an older brother who's uh, completely different to him or, you know, it, oh, you know a, a sister who's a psychiatrist or whatever it might be, you know, yeah. which... Some people might think well, that's not very exciting or interesting, but but it's weird how characters just kind of come alive bit by bit. Yeah, yeah. In terms of because you've written quite a lot of Doctor Who, and I, I just want to concentrate on Doctor Who for a moment. What elements do you think a good Doctor Who story must have? Is there a pool of elements that you have to draw on to make it into a Doctor Who story? The beauty of Doctor Who is Doctor Who's a double-edged sword. The beauty of it is that I honestly think you can come up with any kind of story. So you don't have to stick to the rigid rules, especially if you're right. Yeah, I just don't think you have to stick to kind of really rigid rules apart from, obviously, the things like, you know, the first episode's got to be, it's four episodes, it's got to be 25 minutes each, that kind of thing. But beyond that, I don't think you can. But for me, personally, for me, it's got to be, it's got to be creepy or scary in some way. It's got to Mm. have some creepy element to it. This isn't true of all Doctor Who, but it, this is just the kind of Doctor Who that I love. Secondly, I think the other thing is Doctor Who should always have just kind of, again, and this is growing up with sort of Robert Holmes and, and also just latterly with people like, you know, Russell T. Davis and, and Stephen Moffat, is it should have really snappy dialogue. It should have really dialogue that sparkles. It shouldn't have ordinary, dull, yeah. plodding dialogue. It should every Every line should be important. And I have read Doctor Who books you know published doctor who books where i've thought this is just kind of workmanlike dialogue yeah, it's yeah. you know it's, I'm, not, I'm not naming any but and every line should be should be sparkly you know yeah. it should have a sparkle to it and and i think just with uh, and something that just goes in the, with all fiction is and this is maybe again comes back to the towns of wang chiang and, mm. and robert o is to create really good solid characters mm. in in a very short word space yes in, in short sort of space of time and do you have any thoughts on dialogue or does it just appear for you are you are you one of those guys i mean when i'm writing a script dialogue Mm. comes pretty easily to me Mm. whereas when i'm writing prose it doesn't it's really weird when i've got final draft open and i'm writing audio you know i've I've just done a few things for audible and i'm writing that it comes really fast but when i'm writing prose it really doesn't it's really weird so what are the mark morris rules of dialogue if there are any Ooh, Other than it's got to be snappy, it's got to be snappy. Yeah, I don't. Uh, it's got to push the plot along. It can't be redundant. You can't be just talking about stuff that doesn't matter. It's always you've got to feel as though every everything that everyone says has to count. Yeah, but it all has to sound naturalistic, and it has to have a kind of a, a rhythm and a banter to it. Never start a scene with hello. That's far more to what it starts saying. And I think you're right. It can never be redundant. But then, obviously, naturalistic is not the same as realistic. And, yes. you know, if, if somebody wrote a script of what we've been talking about for the last hour and a bit, there would be bits of it that are interesting, but there'd be lots of ums and ahs and oh, I don't know. And so it's about being naturalistic rather than realistic, because that really would be, that would be dull to listen to, I think, or read. Yeah. And people are, you know, they're nowhere as, as articulate in real life as they are on paper. No. I've, I've had interviews where they, the, the person doing the, the interview has literally then recreated the, um, the conversation verbatim. And on paper, it looks awful. Mm. It makes you both look really stupid. It mm. makes you both look as though you're idiots. 
and so you can't talk properly. And um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so yeah, it took me like it's, it, obviously it has to be kind of it has to be concise and snappy, but it has to have yeah. that sense of feeling like a real conversation about it. Yeah. In terms of structure as well, we haven't talked about structure really. Do you use particular structures? Do you look at, you know, three act structures, five act structures, middle, you know, midpoint, rising, falling action and all that sort of does that ever enter your thinking or not? Not really. It's more instinctive, I would say. Mm. Uh, I haven't read many how to books about writing. Um, and you know how to construct i i just think those those are kind of a bit too constricting i feel as though you should just it should just be a sort of instinctive thing and i think this is one thing that's really hard to teach because i have done writing courses yeah people and it's the one thing that's really really difficult to teach is that you've either got an instinctive feel for for it or you haven't mm. you know I think with uh, the things with Doctor Who is is obviously it's a little bit more regimented. I, I did say you know you can write all mm. sorts of different stories, which you can, there, but but obviously you know with Doctor Who you have to have your part. Say if it's a four parter, which you know a lot of the sort of big finish things that I've written have been, you know you've got to have your set up, you've got to establish the threats, and then you've got to kind of put your main characters in peril at some point during that sort of towards the end of that, and then mm. parts two and three I think are a lot more fluid. You can yeah. kind of do kind of a lot you know move it around a little bit go with the flow of the story a lot more and then obviously once you get to part four you i think you always have to end part three on a really humdinger of a cliffhanger part four then you get them out of that cliffhanger and then after that it's always moving towards the resolution and at some point maybe 15 minutes into the 25 minute episode you should have them in a point of absolute peril where it doesn't look as though they're going to get out of this yeah and then it kind of all, you know, comes together and, and hopefully with a clever kind of denouement, clever ending. Clever. Um, so making, scaring people, how do you mm. do it? How do you scare people, Mark? <laughs> I think if you, talk, if you spoke to most horror writers, they would tell you they're not, they don't kind of write to try and scare people. They just kind of write about their fears and they type, you know, maybe universal fears, maybe their own fears. There are ways of creating atmosphere. I mean, mm. you know, having characters creeping about a supposedly spooky house or whatever, a supposedly haunted house. So there are ways of doing that. And that's just, that's more pacing. That's just sort of pacing you, the use of language and all that, the, the obvious stuff. But I don't kind of set out to scare people particularly. I, you know, I don't think, right, I've got to really terrify people with this. And I think probably because I'm never usually frightened by books. You know, I can be kind of thrilled by them. I can be compelled by them. I can, you know, but, but I can't, there's very few instances where a book has really frightened me. You can, for the characters, mm. you know, and, 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 you know, you want them to, to be okay. And yeah. The most terrifying book I've ever read, which absolutely scared the pants off me, was Pet Cemetery. That book is, you know, Stephen King's Pet Cemetery. Is uh, Nothing I've ever read has ever come close to the afternoon I spent reading that and couldn't put it down. And there was at one point when he's trying to, he's hanging on the tree, trying to get into the cemetery to dig up his wife. And I literally had to put the book down. That was, but yeah, like you, I don't get terrified. So what Stephen King said he wished he'd never written Pet Cemetery. There's that thing in there where he says, you know, I th you go too far, or you know, there are. Is there are there places you won't go? Um, I don't. I mean, probably. I mean, I don't think. I don't think I would ever write a scene where a child is being tortured, for instance. Mm. Particularly, unless it's a particularly I, 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 horrible I, child. <laughs> child. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, um. Yeah. I think you do this kind of. You sort of think you feel like as a horror writer, you you should say. Horror should be very confrontational and nothing, sh there should be no taboos, which part of me believes in. But at the same time, I know that there are certain things I wouldn't write. And I'm not really that interested in long graphic kind of torture scenes or, you know, uh, violence for its own sake. I just, not uh, not because I think it's distasteful particularly, but just because I think it's quite boring. Yeah. I, don't, I just don't know where it, you know, I just don't see the point of it. I think it's more a case of, you know, psychologically kind of disturbing people rather than grossing them out. 
Yeah, no, no, no. There are lots of different types of horror. If you if you think about it, it got its own name, torture porn, didn't it? Those kind of torture porn movies, which are you know they're awful movies to watch, but they're you know they're mainstream horror movies. But it, it's just about making people you know like Saw. They're just torture porn. It's... Yeah, I was going to say that, but the first Saw film's great. I mean, the first Saw film is incredibly clever, and twists and turns, you know, unexpected twists and turns. Mm. But because of the, the graphic violence aspect of it, it then just become that's all it becomes later on. Yeah, yeah. And it become and it just gets leached of ideas. But if I think a lot of people, if you watch the first Saw film, I think a lot of people would be surprised by actually how good the story is. Hmm. And there's another, you know, it's things like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which has hardly any violence in it. Yeah. It's just the intensity of it. It's yeah. just, it's pure in the intensity and then kind of almost nihilistic atmosphere it has. Amazing film. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. It just reminded me when you were talking about kind of being scared by books and you talked about Pet Cemetery. Mm. I think probably the, the probably two or three occasions when I've actually felt scared tense as I as I do watching a, a horror film sometimes. Mm. One mm. was and I was about 13, 14 when I read it, and it was a, it was the summer. I was sitting out in the garden in the summer and I remember reading the bit in the shining with the hedge animals in the summer. Oh wow. Well. And i I remember finding that incredibly creepy and scary even though I was sitting out in the warm sunshine. Yeah. And another one was, um, there's a, a Stephen King book, which I've forgotten the name of now, about the woman chained to the bed and her husband has a heart attack. Yeah, possibly. I know. It's called uh, yeah, Gerald's a, Game. Gerald's Game, thank you. Yes, and there's a scene in the book, and and this was partly because of the circumstances. I had a, like a fluey bug. I was feeling really grotty. Hmm. And so I went and slept in the spare room because I was just coughing and, yeah. you know, yeah, feeling awful. And I remember not being able to, or I might have fallen asleep, and then I woke up, and uh, it was about three in the morning. I was reading Gerald's Game. And I remember there's a scene in Gerald's Game when she's kind of starting to have hallucinations because she's, you know, she's dehydrated and all that kind of thing. And she sees a figure standing in the corner of the room, a dark, tall figure. And she can't work out whether it's real or whether it's part of a hallucination mm. and i remember feeling much as she probably was at the time and um you know and it was it was three o'clock in the morning i had a little lamp on by the side of the bed and finding that incredibly creepy to read yeah. at that time incredibly um, yeah. <laughs> it's a good book and it's a i was surprised at how good the film was i was really knocked out by the film i thought it, it really got to me until you realize that she had a smartphone, so if she'd set up voice calling, <laughs> she could have called the police over, you know. Anyway, so horror again. Do you, as a horror writer, I mean, I don't believe in this. You know, I've had weird experiences that happen to me, but do you have an affinity for the supernatural? Do you have a belief in the supernatural that informs your writing or not at all? You just use it. I kind of just use it. I would love to believe. Mm. I would love to, I want to believe, you know, <laughs> I, I just think it would make life far more interesting. And I would love to genuinely have a supernatural experience, but I can't just believe in it on faith. I would need yeah. some kind of, you know, definite evidence there. It, but, yeah, I've had weird things happen in my life, but I also mm. know, being a, I'm an ex-psychiatric nurse, that mm. people with schizophrenia can see all sorts of things. So the mind can play all sorts of tricks on you when you're not even telling it to do that. So the weird things that happened to me, which were, you know, there were some weird things maybe I'll tell you about one day, but they were certainly weird, but most of them could be explained away by yeah. something just not clicking in the, the head, which people never, people who are into supernatural stuff or believe that they've seen stuff or people, you know, hear the, the voices of the dead, what they don't ever want to admit to or say is, this could be my brain doing it to me and my subconscious doing it to me and me not knowing. But I just wondered if horror writers like yourself, you know, a successful horror writer, uh, whether or not the supernatural was something. Do you think there could be something there that hasn't been discovered yet? I think it's it's one of those things where there's lots of things that are unexplained, but as soon as they become explained, it becomes part of science. It yeah. So it, and I think, you know, there are probably lots of natural, strange, natural phenomena in the world that we don't understand yet or that we mm. haven't made sense of. And uh, But I love the supernatural. I mean, I, yeah. you know, I love things like Strange But True, my yes. gospels. And, <laughs> and it just, I, I lap that stuff up and I just adore it. And yeah. 
and the more convincing it is, the happier I am. <laughs> I think maybe there is something about this, but I still yeah. can't. Believe. I'm with you 100% away but you know I, I don't know if I become a believer when I watch The Exorcist or not I don't uh, maybe there's there's room I don't know so we're coming towards the end of this now Mark and it's been obviously it's been amazing it's fabulous I've enjoyed every second in terms of horror mm. and for you it's not about scaring people but maybe it's about unsettling them what's the best way if you're writing something what are the good ways to unsettle people how do you go about it Just give me your secrets oh god it's just kind of trying to get under people's skins it's just identifying basic human fears and just playing on them i think and a lot of those things are fears that of universal fears a lot of them are personal fears and it's just really just playing on that I, I you know i find this kind of thing really difficult to analyze because it's a lot of it again is a, is a sort of instinctive thing is it therapy but, for you <laughs> um no no not really not my own writing i think maybe i do write out yeah maybe i do write out some of my fears but i never feel better afterwards let's put it right. out you know it's it's sort of just because I'm, if I'm frightened of something and then I write about it, I don't afterwards think, oh, I feel better now. It's just <laughs> sort of just expressing it, but the fear's still there, you know. Is it, do you think, and again, this is just me spitballing here, your subconscious is bubbling away underneath all of this. Yeah. And so the stuff that comes up that pops into your head as ideas, mm. can you trace them back to things that have happened in your life or are they just sparked off of, you know, something you've read or anything like that? Because one of the things we're always told as writers, and I'm sure you've been told this, is write what you know. So if you're a horror writer, what horrors do you know? <laughs> it's that thing, isn't it? Yeah, write what you know. Well, yeah. So I know there are things that I'm terrified of and all the books I've written, the adult books I've written, there's always horrific elements in them, things that would scare me. Do you ever go out of your way to avoid putting the things that scare you in your books or are you okay to mine that and it's not a problem no no i do, i would be okay to mine that and i think the things i'm scared about are the things most of us are scared about are death illness mm. incapacity any anything like that i mean i would the thing that really kind of gets to me is more being incapacitated in some i'm incredibly claustrophobic i hate uh -huh. being blind and so the thought of being, say, for instance, having a stroke and being paralysed, so being wow. like, trapped mm. inside your own body or something, not being able to move and not being able to communicate, you know, mm. I, I get panic attacks thinking about it, you know. And I, and, and we've had a few, we've had a, quite a rocky five years or so as a family. Yeah. You know, my doctor got cancer and my wife has had, has had breast cancer and things. And so a lot of that kind of feeds into it, not in the sense that I write about mm. kids with cancer, but but, you know, a lot of all that that fear and that just that kind of feeling that the rug can be pulled out from under your feet at any moment I, is a scary thing, you know. I can't remember the source, but I read a few years ago, and maybe I'll have to dig it out again and find out what the source was, but horror is about losing control of yourself and your body. That's where all horror comes from. Something else, an external influence, has an effect over you that you can't combat. Now, whether that's a ghost, whether that's a vampire, whether that's a gang of nasty near de wells from a post-apocalyptic future uh, who are coming to steal your food and your water, it's about losing control. So do your characters lose control? Yeah, that's a really valid point, actually. It is about characters in extremis. You know? Yeah. It's about, it is about characters who are losing things, whether that's their, their sanity, their family members, their you know their lives, ultimately, whatever it might be. So, yeah, that, I think that is a very valid point. Yeah, I can't remember where I read it, but I did remember jotting it down. I've got a, a little folder on the computer of stuff like that to remind me yeah. when I'm writing that sort of thing to go back and... Um, right, so, yes, we are pretty much near the end, so we'll do some wrapping up now, Mark. Now, there is a tradition that I've been doing in these. I've been asking the writer, first of all, for the best bit of writing advice they've ever been given. Okay, I think for me, it's quite a simple one. It's just write every day and read every day and not necessarily within your own genre. Uh, yes. The reading part. So just write every day. There are so many writers that I know and, and good writers who just don't get round to it or they think, oh, I'll do some writing at the weekend. Or I'll do some. T and I always say to them, look, just do a bit every day. Everybody can put aside 15, 20 minutes. You know, mm. everybody, if you can put aside half an hour you can write a page if you can write a page by the end of the year you've got 365 pages you've got mm. a novel yeah 
just just write every day don't keep putting it off don't keep making excuses mm. make it a priority and yeah just read for me it's and, and i do appreciate that some people will say if they read then it feeds into their own work and they get influenced by the thing i don't find that i find that mm. the more i read the more inspired i get and and not necessarily that i i will think oh i want to write like that person it's just if i read good writing and good books that compel me i want to do that for other people now that that sounds like an answer to my second question which is what advice would you give is that a piece of advice that you were given and who gave it to you and that was a piece of advice i wasn't given it specifically by one person it's, it's right. a piece of advice i saw i maybe saw at convention you know conventions sitting at pound panels with writers sort of saying and then and I saw it enough times for it to kind of filter into my head. Mm. I may even have read it in something like Stephen King's Dance Macabre or something like yes. that. You know, he may have said it somewhere. So, yeah, I mean, I would pass that on. But I think... What advice would you give? What's Mark Morris 101 writing? And writing would... horror. Writing horror. Well, I, I would say if you are really serious about doing this, writing, you know, this writing lark and making a living out of it, don't say no to opportunities. Mm -hmm. Whatever people, if, if people offer you something that's lucrative and decent and, you know, you think it's good, then do it. And and I, the reason I say that is because I was offered ages ago. I, I had this feeling thing in my head that it would take, it took a certain amount of time to write a novel. And then I was offered, uh, there was a computer game coming out called Dead Island. And my agent got in touch and said, oh, uh, Titan are looking for somebody to write the Dead Island novelization to come out with the book. They didn't have a particular, they had a very rough storyline, that kind of character sketches of the main characters, but literally like a paragraph on each, you know. So it was a case of me having to come up with all the dialogue and basically push the story along and make it from, turn it from a computer game storyline into like a proper novel type. Mm. Storyline. And they offered me this and they said, the only thing is they need it in four weeks. <laughs> and and this was the first time I'd been offered this kind of deal of, you know. How many like, words? I think it was 80,000. So twenty thousand words a week, a week yeah. Twenty thousand words a day, and I'm I'm normally a kind of one thousand words a day, five thousand words at the end of the week type person, and so to sort of write four times more than I normally wrote, my initial thought was, oh my god, there's no way I can do that, and then mm. part of me just uh, I just made myself say yes, and then I put the I remember putting the phone down to my agent, and literally shaking thinking what the hell have i done here but i did it you know i sat down i worked out a plan i pushed myself i i just did the whole thing and i've done it again many times since now you know i've written movie novelizations and tie-in things that have been very very tight deadlines and so that's one thing is don't say no to opportunities absolutely just writing that dead island thing and i now got i've then got the reputation for being pretty reliable you know mark can do this he can deliver it on time he can deliver it to the word length Mm. All that. Uh, and the other thing I would say is is push yourself. You know, don't stick within your comfort zone. Do things that you get offered that you think I, I, if you if you think I can't do this. And I'm not just talking about whether you can physically do it. I mean, yeah. if someone says, "Oh, can you write me a, a predator novel set in space with lots of you know military stuff and science fiction elements or whatever," which is not my forte, don't immediately go, "Oh no, I can't do that. I, yeah. I don't do that kind of thing." Just think. Yes, I'll do it. I'm going to do it and I'm going to push myself and try it, you know. Say yes to everything. I would say yes. To, uh, not, well, yeah, say yes to everything as long as you're getting decent money for it. No, well, yes. Know, and, and, you know, as long as it's a, it's a decent job and you think it will further your career and give you a higher profile. So Absolutely. Yeah. Brilliant. Right, Mark, we've reached the end of our 90 minutes and it's been fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, it's been really, really good. Such a great conversation. Loads of nuggets of good quality information there, and it's been brilliant. So, thank you very much, Mark. You're very welcome. I feel as though it's flown by, to be honest. Yeah, no, that's good. Oh, it's been right. great. Excellent. You take care, mate, and I'll speak to you really soon. All right. Cheers. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. And massive thanks there to Mark Morris. Uh, my guest this week for that really insightful discussion about the talents of Wen Chiang and how to write horror. I'd also like to thank Martin Holmes for his editing help on this episode of Sledgehammer. And Sledgehammer will be back next week on your podcast platform of choice with another fabulous writer discussing one of their favourite Doctor Who stories and how they do the job themselves. Yeah,